Well, thank you so much, Ian and Steve, and uh, for having me here today. Even though I wasn't the invited person, I'll do my best to stand in for Archana. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. So um, I'm going to go over kind of the evaluation after a failed anti-reflux surgery, and then you know our, our um, subsequent speaker is going to talk more about the various mechanisms. So I'm going to help you figure out how we figure that out. I have no disclosures pertinent to this talk. So over the next uh, 10 minutes, we're going to talk about the incidence of failure, um, common symptoms that people might present with after anti-reflux surgery, and then finally spend the remainder of the talk talking about what how do we work these people up? How do we really understand what's causing those symptoms that brought that patient back to your office? So first of all, you're probably wondering why we're having this talk, right? Because anti-reflux surgery works great. It never fails, right? Well, yeah, yes, right, it fails, right? So, so I'm just going to go over a couple of long-term studies uh, because we can all show uh, short-term studies and say that our procedure was great at a month, at two months, at six months, you know, but we really need to look long-term because this is one of the few operations that we do where we're trying to restore functional anatomy. And so this is a nice study looking at 10-year follow-up. It's a relatively um, small group of patients, but at the same time, there are not a lot of uh, long-term um, 10 year follow ups out there of large series, right? And so um, uh, these pa there were 64 patients, and at 10 years, only three of them had to have reoperations, and the majority said they were satisfied with the procedure. Now, 83% said they were satisfied, and honestly, after primary anti reflux surgery, we like to think that number is more in the 90 to 95% um, uh, range um, uh, to help our patients with this most often um, benign disease. Some of the most common procedures that they might come back with include heartburn and dysphagia. And so if you look at the, the blue bars in this graph, this goes through the severity of heartburn pre-op, and the red bars represent post-op. And you can see that pre-op, everybody kind of has pretty bad symptoms, not a lot of heartburn, and then or, or a lot of heartburn, and then post-op, the um, uh, no heartburn or maybe occasional heartburn bars become longer. Now, the interesting thing is the dysphagia bars in this same study. So dysphagia, not a lot pre-op, you know, except for in this uh, last group. But um, in the group that had, or I'm sorry, not a lot of dysphagia um, pre-op, but then post-operatively, we see that amount of dysphagia actually go up pretty significantly. So. Um, when we're thinking about failed anti-reflux surgery, it's really important to think about the symptoms that that patient is presenting with. This is another nice uh, study out of uh, Portland looking at 20 years out. And interestingly, in this study, um, they didn't note a lot of uh, issues with dysphagia. They followed, this was them doing 21-year uh, or 20-year follow-up on their own patients. And um, the primary recurrence symptoms were heartburn and regurgitation, in which um, heartburn recurred in about 20%, regurgitation only in none, pa none of the patients, uh, whereas 6% six uh, had both um, symptoms. Now, if we look at um, the different um, complaints that the patients might have, they kind of broke this out into um, different scores with heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia, um, nausea, um, uh, diarrhea, and we kind of, um, and then uh, trouble belching. And again, so the, the black bars uh, show never. Okay, and this is at 20 years. And then if we look at the light bars, the fourth bar, this is continuous. And so you can see difficulty belching, any of these uh, symptoms other than heartburn and regurgitation tend to be around the 5% range um, further out. So these are things that really kind of affect people's quality of life a little bit more, right? Hyperflatulence, trouble belching, you know, um, early satiety, these are the things that really bother people more on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why it's really hard to understand sometimes some of the symptoms people have because they're kind of all over the place. Okay, um, now let's look at how many people are satisfied with their um, operation. Okay, versus um, being unsatisfied. And see the majority at 20 years, three quarters are still pretty happy with their procedure. 
but we still have about 10% who fall in this fairly unhappy group. You know, this, there's a small percentage that are happy sometimes, not so happy other times. And then in this series, the reoperation rates are one, maybe two per year over the subsequent 20 years. Now, this study um, just focuses on those dissatisfied patients, okay? And how did they feel before their procedures, and how did they feel after? And again, you know, they did a great job of teasing out all the different symptoms that these patients come in with, including heartburn, dysphagia, frequency and severity, feeling food stuck in their throat, <coughs> excuse me, gas bloat, inability to vomit or belch. And you can see again that inability to belch is something that really affects people's quality of life a lot. Bloating is something that they complain about a lot. And so these are some of the symptoms we want to focus on when we're doing our evaluative tests. And so therefore, we want to figure out, first of all, are their post-operative complaints new? Because a lot of times, if you actually do a thorough history, you might find, you know what, they had a lot of diarrhea before the procedure. So possibly that diarrhea had nothing to do with your procedure. So if they're coming to you with that problem now, it may not be related to your procedure at all, but rather something else. So, <clears throat> so a really thorough history is really important um, for these patients. Okay, and then you want to see, do they have recurrent symptoms? Okay, so if the symptoms from beforehand came back, then you start to think, okay, thank you. Maybe something did, is uh, related to my procedure. And then, of course, you have the new symptoms. And these make you think about um, some of the anatomic abnormalities, disruptions, and things like that that might be causing uh, some of the recurrent symptoms. Now, I wanted to uh, also mention a little bit about BMI because, you know, over the last 20 years, if we think about anti-reflux surgery, we've learned a lot about the impact of BMI, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that I've seen change the most in my career in that, you know, in the year 2018, the recommended operation for a patient with a BMI over 35 is a gastric bypass procedure. You wouldn't do a Nissen um, uh, in those patients. Okay, so let's look at um, incidence of dysphagia in patients uh, after uh, surgery. And if you see 53% uh, of patients in the low BMI group present with dysphagia as their recurrent symptom. Not as common a thing in the obese patient. But if we look at the uh, symptom of epigastric pain, that's actually a far more common presenting symptom in the obese patient, and maybe their obesity has something to do with that. Similarly, regurgitation, that intra-abdominal pressure, is that causing some of that regurgitation that that patient's uh, having? And then also, uh, let's look at the state of the fundoplication. When that patient's actually getting their work up, you know, what's that hiatal hernia look like? Um, and uh, or have they recurred the hiatal hernia? Have they disrupted the wrap? And you'll see that as the BMI goes up, you know, the recurrent hiatal hernia becomes more common. And then a failed fundoplication and hiatal hernia also increases uh, with obesity. So, you know, I give, all, I give that to you all as background to uh, know that it's really important to have a very detailed discussion. I spend a lot of time with these patients in clinic to really tease out what their problems are. Um, uh, the, the HRQL uh, questionnaires are helpful, but you still also have to do a really thorough history. And it's important to know how soon after their procedure did the symptoms recur. The patient said, oh, I've been having trouble swallowing since the day I had the operation. In your mind, you're thinking, okay, we're going to have to think about some, maybe an anatomic thing. The symptoms I outlined for you, I think it's very important to tease every single one of those symptoms out. And honestly, if you don't ask about those things, the patient's not going to tell you about it. So it's important that you ask about every single one of those. And then also you want to take into account patient factors. You know, are they obese now? What's their lifestyle? You know, are they eating right next to bedtime? You know, I think these are things that we have to be more cognizant of. Are they eating York peppermint coffees with a, or uh, patties with a cup of coffee? I mean, yeah, you're going to have reflux with that, right? So, so it's important to understand their lifestyle. And then the evaluative tests that I like to get, um, an upper endoscopy, a, a barium esophagram, high-resolution manometry. Um, depending on the symptoms, honestly, if heartburn or regurgitation isn't their presenting symptom, I don't know that a pH study helps you every single time, but for a lot of those patients and the patients that I've been seeing back, 
Uh, it seems like it's more anatomic disruptions has been their problem. And if bloating is one of their symptoms, uh, gastric emptying studies can be helpful. So I'm going to take some time to go through each of these studies. So first of all, I want to emphasize that you know we're trying to understand functional anatomy. So we want to know everything that's happening in this area, and we want to evaluate it with every mode that we have possible so that we understand the function, the anatomy, so that we can restore that function anatomy to normal as much as possible for these patients. Okay? And there's a lot of data to show that if you only do an endoscopy or you only do a manometry, you're going to miss things like hiatal hernias or, or things like that. So, um, so you know, we want to focus on these, these different questions, okay? function and anatomy. So this is a nice uh, study by Triad, or a paper by Triadophilopoulos and his uh, group. And what they did is kind of said, okay, if somebody comes in with failed anti-reflux, then let's kind of follow an algorithm. Let's decide, are there complaints esophageal? Are they GI? And then if they are esophageal, does it have to do with GERD or dysphagia? Those being the most common things. If it's GI, does it have to do with pain? Does it have to do with diarrhea? Does it have to do with nausea? These sorts of things. And then that can kind of help some of the testing algorithm you're going to do. Most of the patients who end up in my office get, get all four of those studies plus minus a gastric emptying study. So symptoms. When I, somebody says, oh, I have heartburn back, well, it might be a loose plication. They say, I have regurgitation back. Again, you might think that their plication might have loosened up. They might have a hiatal hernia. They could have EGJ outflow obstruction where it's not really... Um, uh, reflux coming up and regurgitation from the stomach, but something that happened to the anatomy that's causing pooling in the esophagus and thought, causing contents to come back up. Dysphagia, is there abnormal anatomy, cough? Um, when I see patients complain of cough, it makes me think more about EGJ outflow obstruction or reflux. And then finally, if they have chest pain, epigastric pain, again, I'm thinking about their anatomy, I'm thinking about obesity. So endoscopy. Endoscopy is always the first test you want to get in these patients. You know, you want to assess the presence of a hiatal hernia. You can see this patient's plication is above the diaphragm hiatus. The nissen appears like there's maybe like a hill grade two, two valve here. Um, again, here you see a very patchless LES. Okay? And, uh, and then this patient looks like they have a more intact uh, appearing um, plication. The other thing you want to know is inflammation, retained food, stricture, bowel reflux, H. pylori. Okay, so this is just kind of a, a video um, that, that Archana uh, gave me from one of her GIs. And so it's really important. I, I take a lot of pictures when I do endoscopy, and you're going to see a lot of like snapshots, which I was happy that this gastroenterologist does the same thing. So he's like, oh, look, there's some inflammation. Boom. You see a little outpouching of the gastric folds there. Okay, let's take a little picture of that. And then um, he takes a really nice uh, thorough look of the esophagus. And then we're going to go through the LES now. And when you go through the LES, what are we going to look for? We're going to see, is it easy to get that scope through? Is it, uh, you know, do I see any kind of a pouch effect? Or do I see any type of a hiatal hernia? And then as soon as I enter the stomach, what do I see in that stomach? Do I see retained food? Do I see bile? You know, what's going on uh, in that stomach? And then we're going to... Uh, kind of the steps that I follow the same, then I look at my pylorus, get a good view of my antrum, I'm looking for any type of inflammation, maybe some pyloric stenosis that could cause some backup in the plumbing if there's um, recurrent symptoms. Do a look in the du duodenum, if the patient has diarrhea, you might check for uh, celiac. Um, uh, also, um, if they have more GI symptoms, SIBO testing might be warranted in these patients, H. pylori testing. And then we're going to come back into the stomach. And we're going to do a retroflex view of the cardia. And, and for me, that's a really, really important um, part of the uh, endoscopy. Really important to have a good understanding of what this should look like. You know, and so what do we see here? Well, it looks like this patient's had a plication. You know, it looks like it might, it doesn't hug the scope as much as we would like to see it hug the scope. You know, um, and so, so it, it, but we do see that kind of stack of coins appearance. Um, of the uh, of the gastric fold, so we at least don't think that there's a twist in the uh, plication that's formed here. Okay, the other important test is an esophagram, right? We want to evaluate the function of that uh, GE junction. Allows us another way to look for a hiatal hernia, and again assess the integrity of the plication. So this just happened to be a patient that uh, I operated on just a 
few short weeks ago who told me that she had had a, uh, a nissen fund application about 15 years ago and started having trouble swallowing almost immediately afterwards. So in this esophagram, I see a lot of things, and I really want you to keep this mental picture in your mind, because then I'm going to show you the manometry, and I think it's really important at, to kind of put all these tests together as you're coming up with your idea. So if you look here, so the LES is up here, and you can see that there's a little bit of stomach and a hiatal hernia here. You see the plication here, it's kind of funny looking, that's not kind of what you expect it to look like on an esophagram. So it gives you an idea that there's something funny happening at the GE junction here. This is not the same person that I showed you the endoscopy for. Then esophageal manometry, so it's a very important if you don't read the manometry yourself to have a really good relationship with the person who does read your manometry. I think high resolution manometry is kind of the current standard of care. It really allows us to esophageal, uh, understand esophageal function, under, understand LES physiology, and co really complements what you might see on your endoscopy and your esophagram. So this just happens to be uh, a manometry of a patient who presented with reflux, and the top half of the frame is the uh, impedance, the bottom half is the high resolution manometry, the UES, the LES, the LES looks a little loose, looks like there's a little hiatal hernia here, um, maybe a little sliding hiatal hernia. But this is a patient who presented with reflux um, uh, about 20 years after their Nissen. What do we see here? Well, we see the esophagus coming down, but in between swallows, we see no LES pressure, and then look down here. Wow, there's another high pressure zone. What could that be? Actually, that's a hiatal hernia, and then the wrap looks like it's completely non-functional and not helping this person's LES at all. And then here's a, another patient. Uh, this is actually the, the uh, manometry of the patient whose esophagram I showed you, and we see uh, like three high pressure zones here, right? You got the LES here, we got another pressure zone here, and we got another pressure zone here. And it comes with experience, you know, in looking at a lot of these that you can, you can see these nuances, but, but when we compared that to our endoscopic pictures, what were those pressure zones? We had the LES, we had the plication, we had her diaphragmatic closure. So three different things, disruptive anatomy, causing a lot of symptoms, making her feel miserable for the last 15 years. And she, um, she felt better the day after her operation. It was, it was pretty amazing once we uh, corrected her anatomy. A pH study, um, we can do these wireless, uh, we can do these with impedance, okay? And if somebody has recurrent reflux symptoms, heartburn symptoms, or if you think any of the symptoms that they have are related to reflux, then a pH study, I think, should be done. I, Unless somebody comes in with just gross dysphagia, the endoscopy shows, you know, a real anatomic abnormality, um, I, um, then I may forego this procedure. But if they have anything related to reflux at all, I think you have to do an evaluation. And what are we looking for this? Well, we want to look at symptom correlation. We want to quantify the amount of reflux that's coming up. And it's not uncommon to get these studies, patients say they have their reflux symptoms, and, and then you don't see any reflux. So what are your options? Well, you can say, well, reflux isn't really your problem, or you may um, choose to do a non-acid impedance study um, to further evaluate um, the movement of volume uh, through the esophagus. The other thing that I've seen in patients post-anti-reflux surgery is it's actually the heartburn they feel is not refluxate coming up from the stomach, but they've developed an EGJ outflow obstruction from the anatomic disruption that they have of their plication or the recurrence of the hiatal hernia. So the heartburn they're feeling is actually pooling of fluids in the esophagus, and you can appreciate that with uh, impedance. So, um, so these are all the different nuances you want to look at. And then finally, gastric emptying. If your patient complains of bloating, they complain of nausea and vomiting, you know, this is a very uh, helpful study to get. Um, just to understand how that person's uh, stomach is working. Did they have a vagal injury at the initial operation? Is this something that we're going to have to take into account when we're looking at a revisional procedure? So in conclusion, I think it's really important to do a very thorough evaluation after anti-reflux surgery that is not only a combination of the history that the patient gives you, their symptoms, when the symptoms occur, how it relates to their meals, how it relates to their lifestyle, and then work it up with a combination of endoscopy, esophagram, manometry, pH study, and any other GI testing you see appropriate. The symptoms can help guide you as to what you might find on some of these studies, and then use these tests to make an operative plan. I think our subsequent speaker is going to tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you.